Hello, everybody. It's nice to be with you uh, to go through and to discuss single point measurements, uh, uh, current measurements in oceans, lakes, and rivers. Um, the agenda for today is going to be uh, first of all, I'm going to say a few words about how a Doppler current meter work and, and uh, what the, the specifics of a single point sensor is. Then we will move into uh, a session or a section of this uh, where we talk about applications, where these instruments are being used, giving examples of that. And we will then move on to what to be aware of, especially when setting up a vector, because that is a type of single point sensor that requires a little bit of concern when setting it up. And finally, we will go through how current meters for mean flow are used and how they work. Now, if we move to the uh, two types of current single point current meters that Nortec make, uh, it, we see this in this, this slide. Uh, on the left side, left hand side, we see what we call a vector, which is a type of sensor that's called a acoustic Doppler velocimeter. On the right hand side of the screen, we have a single point sensor used more for mean flow measurements. And I'm coming back to, to both of these. Firstly, let's talk a little bit about how a Doppler current meter works. Some of you may be familiar with this, but it's nice to know a little bit about it anyway. Basically, how these instruments are constructed uh, is that they, they have, a, what we, what's illustrated here, this, this brown uh, square, is a, what, what's illustrated to be a, a transducer. So that is a ceramic plate that vibrates at a certain frequency. In the case of the vector, this is 6 million times per second, while we also make ADCPs that go down to 55 kilohertz or 55,000 times per second. That vibration sets up an acoustic pulse that travels through the water column. This is illustrated here. So that, that pulse, as it hits particles that are always present in the water, some of the energy will be reflected back to the instrument. And if that particles move either away from or towards the transducer, then the, the sound will come back with a different frequency from what was sent out. This is what we call the Doppler shift, and it's exactly what we measure. There are two types of sensors, two types of, of, uh, of configurations. One is where we use the same element as both the transmitter and the receiver. This is what we call a monostatic Doppler sensor. And it's typical for the traditional type of ADCP, the acoustic Doppler current profiler. The other type of instrument is where the transmitter and the receivers are located in different positions physically, where we transmit sound along one path and then receive along another one. And effectively what we do is to measure the, the speed of the particles in that sampling volume along an axis that, go, that lies between these, which is the bistatic axis. And the vector, which is the instrument I'm going to talk about first, is a, an example of a, a bistatic sensor, where <clears throat> these, the, it has a transmitter in the middle, it has receivers distributed around that transmitter, and they all focus on a small sampling volume that lies quite close to the probe itself. So it uses focused acoustic beams to measure the 3D velocity in that, that small sampling volume. The vector uses what we call a coherent Doppler technology, and I'm coming back to what that means, but in practice it means that it gives us between 100 and 500 times improvement in uh, space-time resolution compared to any type of ADCP. And that in turn makes it possible to measure very fast, in the case of the vector, up to 64 times per second in a small sampling volume, which is about one cubic centimeter of size. This is ideal for turbulence measurements. It's ideal for measurements very close to boundaries. We're talking less than one centimeter about, uh, away from any boundary. So this is a very specialized type of measurement. If you look at this, a little bit more in detail. We have the transmitter here. We have, this is a 2D representation. We have two receivers. And at some point in time, T, 
we transmit a very short pulse that travels through this small sampling volume. The reflection from particles in this volume comes back to the receivers with a certain frequency. Then at time t plus delta t, we send another very short pulse. By the time that pulse reaches this volume, then the particle will, or the particles in that volume will, will have moved a little bit. This means that the signal comes back to the receivers with a different phase from what we sent out. And we measure that phase to calculate the frequency shift from that. The challenge with this is that when you measure phase, you have the problem that cosine to minus pi is the same as cosine to pi. In other words, we, we are not able to measure phase shifts that are larger than plus minus pi. When they become bigger than that, this leads to spikes in the data or so-called phase ambiguities. So we need to know something about the medium that we measure. We need to know something about, about the velocities that we are going to measure. And this is why the vector has the capability or the possibility when you set it up to select a certain velocity range. And a natural question would be, why not select the biggest velocity range of all and then use that all the time? The problem with that is that also the noise is, is, uh, is uh, uh, increasing with increasing velocity ranges. So you can't measure small velocities with a high velocity range without drowning your, your, your signal in noise. So that's why for small velocities, we may need to select small velocity range. And for higher velocities, we need to select the higher velocity range. And it's all because we want to avoid those phase ambiguities. So in summary, the vector uses focused acoustic beams to measure in a small sampling volume. It uses signal scattering from small particles. It uses the coherent processing technique with pulse pairs measuring phase shifts and can measure up to 64 times per second in just one cubic centimeter of sampling volume. This instrument is used to measure turbulence, low flows, very low flows down to less than one millimeter per second and very close to boundaries. To illustrate what instruments like this are used for, we have here an, an example of a river with a, an obstruction, a barrier in the river. If we look at the flow speed, we see that this is quite high, but it's obstructed with this barrier. So behind that barrier, it's low. So red colors correspond to high velocities and the, the green and light blue correspond to low velocities. Now, if we look at the turbulent intensity instead, we see that the situation is different. Behind the barrier, the turbulent intensity is very high. And the same is true for the dissipation rate. So obviously, if you want to measure what's going on behind here, you need a different type of instrumentation than a normal average current meter. Looking at this from a streamwise profile instead, this is the same area with and without the barrier. And you see here that the flow comes down the river. Uh, it's quite uniform, but once the barrier is there, the flow rate or the, the speed of the water decreases behind the barrier. While, as we saw, the turbulent intensity is actually increasing a lot there. So if we want to measure in these areas, we need a specialized tool. Now, if we go into looking at more at the applications that the vector is used for, here is an example of measurements done in floodplains and in swash zones. Typical for these areas is that they are dry during low tide while when the tide comes in, they are submerged. And scientists very often want to know what's going on close to the seabed in situations where the tide comes in. And that is something the vector is, is perfect for doing because we can position the measurement volume very close to the seabed and we can measure once the water level is maybe only 15 to 20 centimeters high. Another area where the vector is used quite frequently is in conjunction with coral reefs. So this scientist here is, uh, is illustrating or showing how measurements are done very close to a coral. Uh, again, 
to be able to map or to to make measure currents so close to these substrates or to these uh, these structures is very very difficult if you use something else with a larger sampling volume. You also have here an example of a vector mounted with measurements inside of a sponge. These sponges they they live from from filtering water and with the vector it's possible to measure the flow speed in and out of the sponge. This application example is, uh, is uh, also from coral reefs, uh, but in this uh, setup, it, the, measure, the, the measurements are made close to the surface instead. So you see here the probe is oriented towards the surface and measurements are done only a couple of centimeters below the surface. Scientists are quite often concerned with what happens with mangrove trees uh, and how these are, can reduce erosion. The mangrove roots and, and branches, uh, con they construct a complete maze uh, and it's very difficult to measure <clears throat> inside of these. And especially if you use an instrument with a large sampling volume. So again, the vector is a very useful tool in these highly detailed measurements that, that are done in, in between the, the roots of a mangrove tree. Uh, Another example of how the vector is very commonly used is uh, when we measure in or when the me when measurements are made in vegetation uh, at the seabed. So here we have two different ways uh, the, the vector is oriented. One is where the probe is, is upwards, measuring the, the speed of the, the, of the water just above the canopy. And in the other example, we have the, the probe oriented downwards to measure inside of the canopy. This is an example of a fairly uh, complex uh, deployment frame with lots of different instruments uh, mounted to it, but where also vector, the vector is, is mounted. When you have uneven bottoms, uh, there, there will be uh, turbulence formed uh, close to the seabed, and that's where the vector can do a very good job in measuring this close to, to the bottom. In this other example here, we have an array of vectors mounted on top of each other, where all of these are synchronized so that they measure exactly at the same time and where boundary profiles, very detailed boundary profiles can be made based on this. Uh, we also have an example here which is quite specialized uh, and uh, I know there are members of the audience here with a lot more experience of this than I do. So hello to Peter Berg and your students. Um, this is where the vector is used in combination with uh, high velocity sampling rate uh, oxygen sensors and using a special method called the eddy covariance method to measure the oxygen flux in and out of the, uh, the seabed. In this setup, the, uh, the uh, oxygen sensors are positioned such that they measure exactly the same play, same, uh, in the same, same volume as the vector measures the velocities. And finally, we also have the possibility to measure, to do these detailed measurements even in deep waters. This is an example from a platform that is mounted at 373 meters depth, but you can do the same down to 4,000 meters. So to summarize, the vector is used for process studies. It is used to measure orbital wave uh, velocities and both under breaking waves and, and under more uh, linear waves. Um, they're, they're used in surf zone dynamic studies and they're used for boundary layer studies because the ability, they have the ability to measure very close to the seabed. Quite a few applications also involve low flow uh, and I was saying down to millimeter per second velocities. Again, this is something that is very difficult for other types of instruments to do. And of course, for turbulent measurements. So we talked about a little bit about what to be aware of when setting up the, the vector. Remember, remember that the instrument measures with pulse pairs, measuring the phase shifts between the first and the second pulse in the pulse pair. So we have to set up the uh, the, uh, the velocity range prior to the measurements in order to 
space to, to keep that time difference between the pulses to the proper level. The other thing we have to decide before the instrument is deployed is the sampling rate. So the sampling rate should be selected anywhere from one hertz up to 64 hertz, depending on the application it's going to be used for. And in conjunction with that, it's important to also know that the, there are two different sampling strategies. One is to do it continuously, but of course, if you, if you collect data at 64 hertz uh, for several days, then the amount of data is going to be very, very high. So sometimes it's better to use a burst sampling uh, strategy instead where the user just decides how often the bursts are going to be collected and how many samples per burst at the selected sampling frequency that's going to be done every time. So that was the vector. Then the second group of single point sensors that Nortec make uh, is the what we call the mean flow current meters. This is an instrument called the Aquadop. This is what we call a narrow band current meter. So here we send out single pulses and we measure the directly the frequency shift along each of the beams that comes back from particles in the water. The footprint or the, the, the length of these pulses is typically one and a half meters when they come back. So the, the pulse length is 75 centimeters typically. And what we do is to measure, as I said, the, the velocity along each of the beams, and then we combine that information with knowledge about the orientation of the beams to form three, a 3D vector in between these beams. So an Aquadop current meter collects data in a much larger sampling volume than the vector does. And it's also capable of measuring Farther, apart, farther away from the sensor than the vector is. So as you see here, the, uh, the, the measurement cell can be positioned anywhere from 30 centimeters and out to five meters away from the sensors. The other advantage of a narrowband system is that you don't need to be concerned with, uh, with the expected velocities. This instrument measures equally well for slow and for fast velocities, up to five meters per second along the beams. And it can be used for wave measurements in combination with the current. We have made it possible to use this in very many different types of applications with different head configurations. This is tip it's a standard mooring type head. This is a symmetrical head. Here we have what we call a hockey puck head used for seawall mounts, for instance. This one is when you want to place the sensor very close to the seabed looking upwards. And here is a 2D head used for side looking applications. The Aquadop is also made in a deep water version or two deep, deep water versions, one with 3000 meter rating and one with 6000 meter rating. Uh, in this graph here, you see an example of uh, such an instrument mounted on a CTD rosette being taken down to 3000 meters depth from the surface and then back again. And if you look carefully here, you will see that on the way down, the difference between the lowering speed of the winch and the measured vertical velocities was only six millimeters per second, while on the way up, it was one millimeter per second. That illustrates that also in the inter interior of the ocean, uh, a Doppler type sensor can give very good data. The Aquadop was designed for long-term use in the oceans. These are used on, on deep water marines that often stay in the water for several years. And illustrated here, you see that with 10 minutes between measurements, uh, this can be in the water for more than a thousand days on internal batteries only. So it's a very useful instrument for long-term moorings that are not coming to the surface uh, other than every second or third year. The physical dimensions of the sensor is also quite attractive because it's possible to, to deploy these through boreholes in, under the ice sheet. So the Aquadop is frequently used both in the Arctic and the Antarctic to measure currents below the ice. And here is an illustration of how it's mounted on the mooring line and also how the same instrument is mounted in a low 
profile seabed frame to measure close to the bottom. It's not as close as with the, the vector, but it's still quite close. And the final example I'm going to show is uh, using these signal point sensors on risers for oil, oil, oil production. They're often used in combination with motion sensors on the risers to measure the currents that act on the risers and then the motion sensors measure how the riser performs.